Morning, church. So good to be here with you today. Are you awake? You ready? You want to learn something? Sorry, I can't help you. Just kidding. Please turn with your Bibles to 1 John. If you make it to Revelation, you went a little too far. If you stopped at Peter, you didn't make it quite far enough. 1 John chapter 2. Name of the series is Abide. That's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We are a few weeks into this now, and we just keep seeing this word abide. It keeps showing up. We are to abide in Christ. God abides in us. We're to abide in the word. Abide means remain, hang on to, stay in. And so that's our focus through the entirety of this series, and that'll be uh, front and center in today's teaching. We'll be picking up in verse 12 here in a second because we already started chapter 2, but that's where we'll be. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. Lord, we come before you today asking that by the power of your spirit that we would hear your word fresh today. That you would speak to each and every one of us. No matter where we are in our walk, in our faith today, you have a message for us. And I pray that you would open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to understand what you are going to say today. That we might take it in and and apply it to our lives and make a difference in the world. May it make a difference in us so that we can make a difference in the world for the sake of your great name. And it's in that name that we ask. And God's people said, Amen. little children in verse 12. It's the same as we saw back in verse 1. The word means darling infants. It's a term of endearment. In verse 13, it's a different word. It just means one who is still immature not a negative connotation necessarily, just a statement of fact, just not mature yet. And you parents know exactly what this is like when you have a, a baby or a toddler. Pretty much everything they do is cute. They are a darling infant. Even in their rebellion, they're adorable, right, most of the time. Now, if they are still acting like that when they're 8, 9, 10, 16, they are no longer darling infants. They're just immature. So that's the difference between the two terms that are used here. Um, the terms little children, fathers, young men, uh, they're, they're meant to describe the levels of spiritual maturity of different believers, which doesn't necessarily correlate to how long they have been believers. You should expect steady development in the life of every saved person from just getting started, learning the basics to uh, ready to get to work for the Lord, and then progressing on to being able to give wise spiritual counsel to everybody who is coming up behind you. Sadly, this isn't always the case. Anybody can become an old Christian. It just takes time. Not everyone matures, though, because that takes choice. That takes a seeking. That takes wanting to grow in the faith. Wanting to be more useful to the Lord and to the rest of the world around us. The writer of Hebrews addresses this unfortunate circumstance. Uh, chapter 5 of Hebrews, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled. And the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And the amplified version, uh, verse 13 of that reads like this, For everyone who continues to feed on milk is obviously inexperienced and unskilled in the doctrine of righteousness, of conformity to the divine will in purpose, thought, an action, for he is a mere infant, not able to talk yet. It's a sad circumstance when someone made into a new creation chooses to remain in a state of infancy. 
never moving forward in their faith, being content to just be saved. Never become able, becoming able to take in the sustenance of the Word, the meat of the Word that, that builds up disciples and equips the saints for the work of the ministry before us. But be that as it may, the cool thing about the Word of God is that it is able to speak to anybody, no matter their level of spiritual maturity. That's why you can read through the entire thing over and over and over again, year after year, and still learn more and more every time you go through it. It's because you are progressing. As you study through the Word, you're getting built up. You're becoming stronger. You're able to take more of the solid food. And by the time you make it through and you go back, now you're on solid food already. Now there's new stuff jumping out at you when you read it through the next time. And that's going to continue over and over and over again. We're never going to exhaust what there is to learn from this book. That's why John says that he is writing to everybody in the faith. Because regardless of your maturity, you will be hit with different versions of the exact same temptations, the exact same problems as everybody else. So you need whatever knowledge about it that you're able to digest right here and right now. So please be comforted in the fact that if you are a brand new believer or you are a, a mature believer, not just an old Christian, but a mature Christian, there will be sustenance for you in the teaching of the Word today. To me, that just proves the authorship of God, of Scripture. Men could not write a document that just keeps teaching and teaching and teaching everybody, but God did. It's a worthwhile exercise to question yourself on just where you fit in the grand scheme of things so that you will know just what types of abilities you should be expecting from yourself or rather what abilities God is expecting from you right now. We start as little children. Having just been introduced to the Lord, then we are trained up to be workers and warriors for the sake of ourselves and others, the kingdom. Then we grow into the position of being the spiritual elders of the faith. Not the office of elder in the church, but the untitled mentors of the faith. The ones who the rest of us can all look to for sound advice, for comfort, for the stability that comes from walking with God for an extended period of time in trustworthy faith. And yeah, I said we. I have mentors too. My desire is to be a little bit ahead of you so that I can help you come along, but there are are godly men that I reach out to and ask advice of and ask to help me understand things. Again, that's a never-ending process. The real growth, according to John here, happens in the young men phase. It happens by the overcoming of the evil one. And that happens when the Word of God abides in a person. Who modeled this perfectly for us? What's the answer always? Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. I heard a story of one time of a kid in a Sunday school class. And they were studying something. And some kind of bird came up in the thing. And, and the teacher asked, what kind of bird is this? Pointed to the picture. And nobody said anything. Finally, one little kid, kid said, I don't know. But it must be Jesus. The answer in this class is always Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the one who modeled for us. What a life that is, a, when the word is abiding in a person, what their life looks like. When tempted in the desert by the enemy himself, Jesus answered every temptation, every twisting of what the devil was saying the word meant with the quotation of what the word actually said. And not only that, Jesus wasn't able to just quote the verses. He made it clear that his intent was to submit to that teaching of the verses and not to fall prey to the temptation. See, that's the key. We can't just know it. We, we have to pray, read, and do what it says. In Psalm 119, verse 9, David says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. How do we grow and mature in the faith? By taking heed according to the word. How do we be light and salt to the world around us so that they might be turned to Jesus and be saved? By taking heed according to the word. That phrase, take heed, in the original language, it means regard, keep, observe, the way you would observe something ceremonial, uh, observe a, 
a habit. Pray, read, do. So what John has given us is a step-by-step explanation of what our growth as followers of Christ should look like. And in the explanation is an understanding that you can't skip steps and keep moving forward. Each level builds upon the last. I was recently talking to somebody who is a, a boss at a, at a, at a, a factory, and their, one of their big problems is new people come in, and not only do they want the same pay as the people that have been working there for 20 years, but they want the same responsibilities. They want to come in saying, okay, I can take control of that. I, I know how to do that. And he's like, no, you don't know how to do that. You're, you're a babe, and you have to progress. You can't skip steps. You can't go from here to here. You have to take the process and go through. And our faith is the same way. Now, it doesn't have to take a long time because we can seek the help of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to take decades to get spiritual maturity. It can happen very quickly. But you do have to follow the process. Well, what's the process? First, you have to receive forgiveness and salvation. Because you can study the Bible all day. You can take in all the information. You can memorize it. But if you haven't been reborn yet, it doesn't matter. It doesn't help. You cannot change your life by knowing this or even trying to implement it if you have not been saved. But as soon as that is settled, we should immediately begin studying the Word, memorizing it, meditating on it, talking about it with other people, applying it to our lives as soon as we have an understanding of what it means so that we can overcome the wicked one. That's the the big part in step two. So that we can become the battle-tested mentors that the rest of those coming up in the system need. Now, maybe that feels like a lot of responsibility and a lot of work to you. Don't let the thought of it overwhelm you. For one thing, if you have achieved the first step, and you have become a darling infant in the eyes of God, then you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you to help with everything. You need to make the choice to want to mature, but He's the one that provides the mechanism. He's the one that provides the information. He's the one that gives you the ability to understand it. He's the one that gives you the ability to put it into action. In addition to that, keep in mind, asking, seeking, and knocking. That's what Scripture exhorts us to do. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Those are things that always get a loving and a helpful response from the Lord. They build momentum and strength and stamina that makes the building process going on inside of you more and more and more fruitful with less and less and less effort. I don't think there's anything in here that says, okay, get saved and just sit there and let it wash over you and you will become mature. No, I think the Bible teaches a very proactive faith where he does the work, but we have to make the choice. But if you would just start doing that, you will build the kind of momentum that once you're moving, not only is it hard to stop you, you just keep getting more and more and more momentum. A lot of that comes from one special ability that comes with maturity, simplification. I can tell you that everything in my life is getting simpler as I go. My faith is simpler, meaning I don't overthink and try to figure out every single point of every single doctrine anymore. More and more, I find it enough to just believe. My plan is simpler, meaning I've chosen to just focus on the two commandments, which are? Because when I chase them, everything else starts to fall in place where it belongs. My prayers are unbelievably simpler than they used to be because I've learned from God that he doesn't need me to work everything out and then forward my proposals to him for him to rubber stamp. He knows much better than I do what needs to happen. So it's better if my prayers are simple. Lord, provide for me. Lord, protect me. Lord, lead me. I don't want to come up with a plan, Lord, what would you have me do today? When you go back and look at the model prayer that Jesus offered, it's extremely simple. I'm actually reading a book right now called 21 Seconds, and it's all about how that model prayer, if you will take it to heart and pray it with a heartfelt desire for it to be impactful in your life, it really covers everything, and it only takes 21 seconds to say it. 
simplify. The more complex we make things, the more we lose the the beauty of the simplicity of this relationship that we have with Jesus, this offer that we have to be in a relationship with Him. I heard one pastor put it this way, as you walk with Jesus, spiritual life gets simpler and simpler because the longer you walk with Him, the fewer principles there are. I used to have notebooks full of principles concerning success in ministry, theology, and family. But the more time that passes, the more I say, Jesus, you're my life. Not ministry, not theology, not success as a family, but just you. I love being with you. I love talking with you. I just love you. If a love for Jesus begins to overwhelm and guide your life, the rest of this stuff will fall into place. When you start seeing that happen, that's when you're going to know that you're reaching the state of spiritual fatherhood. Being a parent in the faith, taking a part in the reproduction process. That's the importance of making it to that last step. You become part of the building of the kingdom. Bringing others into the fold. Go and make disciples, Jesus said. Too many Christians are content to just be saved and just come to church. And Jesus said, go. Go and make disciples. Teach them what you have learned from me. Do what you have learned from me. Be a good example. Show them light. Show them salt. Go and make disciples. Be fruitful and multiply. That's always been what God said. When he sent people into the world, he said, go, fill the world. Be fruitful and multiply. That's what we want here. We want Jesus adding to the church daily those that are being saved like we read in Acts chapter 2. But that only comes when you guys go and make disciples. The guiding principle of Calvary Chapel is a movement is to just simply teach the word simply. Let it feed the sheep And make them healthy because healthy sheep reproduce naturally. That's how it's supposed to work. Verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Again, John is providing some evidence to look for in your life, proof that you have become a new creation in Christ so that you can rest in that, basking in the peace and the comfort and the hope that it provides. So here's the question. Is your heart... Is your affection, is your loyalty divided between God and the world? Between the things of God and the things of the world? I know you're busy. I know you have things to do. I know you can't uh, study and worship and fellowship all day long every day. You have jobs. You have kids to take care of. You have responsibilities. I know, I know, I know, I know. But do you love God or do you love that? That is the question. Is your loyalty divided? Because the hard reality expressed here is that if you feel like you're straddling the fence between the two, you need to know that there is no fence. People are always telling me, well, I'm I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to come to church more. I'm trying to read more. I'm trying to pray more. I'm like, like, listen, I hope you do all those things. What you need to do is love God instead of the world. You need to love what He has to offer and let Him provide the things that He wants you to have instead of chasing the things and then trying to add Him to your pile of stuff. It will never work that way. It can't. He won't allow it to work that way because there's no glory for Him in it. There is no fence. Verse 15 says, if there is love of the world's things in us, there is no love of the Father in us. Since to love Him necessitates a hatred by comparison for anything 
not in line with him. And the love that is talking about here, when you go back and look at the Greek, it's agapeo, be kindly affectionate towards. It's not agape. That's the love that we see most often in Scripture. That means be a blessing to, to serve others sacrificially. It's be kindly affectionate towards, and that's an important distinction in this particular context. You can follow the rules and be charitable and read the Scriptures and go to church and and do all the rest of the stuff that is meant to express love for God without being kindly affectionate towards Him. You can do the chores out of responsibility and not love. And that is what he is looking for. Kindly affection towards him. So, if we find this sort of affection within us for the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, then we are aligning ourselves with what is not of God. Now, that's obviously a problem anyway, since he is God. He's he's worthy of submission in the first place just because he's God. But also, we know we can trust his intentions toward us. And that what he requires and desires for and from us is where the blessings are in the here and now. So it makes no sense to love the things of the world instead of him from that perspective. And it's just wrong because he's God. You can't win against God. John, though, he, he mentions a different reason as to why it's not in our best interest to choose to not only, to, to only be kindly and affectionate towards uh, things of the world instead of God. Verse 17, and the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. To choose the things of the world over God is to cling to a, the mast of a sinking ship when there's a lifeboat right there. The ship is going down. This world is going down. It's going to pass away. Don't be so embroiled in stuff and the relationships here. I, I'm not saying don't pay attention to relationships. I'm saying love God and that will guide you in your relationships. That will guide you in everything else. In our daily Bible reading, recently there was a warning about this exact thing. As God spoke through Jeremiah that Israel was about to be overwhelmed by their enemy because of rebellion against him, which is something we see all the time. We're not surprised by that. But one of the things he seemed to be really upset about was the fact that when Israel needed help, when they thought they were in trouble, they had stopped turning to him. They were trying to solve their own problems. They had other nations that they thought were their friends. They had Egypt that they could hire soldiers and horses from, and they started turning to their neighbors and their friends to to come and help protect them when they were in danger. And God was angry because He is supposed to be the one they turn to. He is supposed to be the one that we turn to. If we turn to our friends and our neighbors and, and our own devices... We're doing the exact same thing that Israel did then. And we're loving the world instead of him. Not more than him, instead of him. Because of what John says, if you love the things of the world, there is no love of the Father in you. It's not my distinction. It's John's. Don't shoot the messenger. In describing the circumstance of his people when they (coughs) come under judgment, Scripture makes this following point about that scenario where he was angry that they wouldn't turn to him. In Lamentations chapter 1, verse 7, In the days of her affliction and roaming, Jerusalem remembers all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the enemy with no one to help her, the adversaries saw her and mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem has sinned gravely, therefore she has become vile. All who honored her despise her because they have seen her nakedness. Yes, she sighs and turns away. Her uncleanness is in her skirt. She did not consider her destiny. 
Therefore, her collapse was awesome. She had no comforter. It goes on and on and on, but the point made is that for all of that help, all of those neighbors, all of those friends, all of their own abilities, everything they were counting on, they were overwhelmed and taken into captivity because God was against them, because they had turned from their love for Him. And He would not allow any help. We need to remember that. They were sure that they would be fine, that they had plenty of support. But what happens when God turns on you? And support disappears. Why does God turn on you? Because He's trying to teach you something. If you're not His, He's trying to draw you to Him. If you are His, He's trying to say, stay near me. Stop trying to do it on your own. I never told you to do it on your own. I never told you to figure it out. I said, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. I said, seek first the kingdom, and these things that you need will be added to you. I have said, God says, I am your help, your comfort, and your strength. That's why the love of the world always brings disappointment beyond just the here and now. It's, it's not only not helpful now, it will dissipate on you. But long term, it's going away. It is a sinking ship. Everything that is not of God will pass by you and pass away. It will dissipate. And when that happens, you want to be found clinging to Him instead of all of that other stuff. Scripture does give us this warning multiple times so that there can be no confusion in John's gospel. Well, no, no actually this is in 1 John chapter 5. A little bit later on, we'll see this. We know that, that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So if it's not of him, it is from the wicked one. James chapter 4, verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I keep hearing people saying, why is God against me? He's not. He's for you. You have made yourself an enemy to God. By your choices, by your direction, it does not have to be that way. The important thing to remember is this phrase that describes those who find themselves clinging to the wrong things. The love of the Father is not in him, John says. Jesus is actually even a little more direct than that when he talks about this. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus says, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. This fence that American Christians love to try and straddle, like how much of the world can I keep by getting just close enough to Jesus that I'm okay? That whole thing is a figment of our imagination. It doesn't exist. Jesus says, you are with me or you are against me. Not just not with me against me. The love of the Father is not in you if you're not with Him. If you ever have any trouble figuring out whether or not something qualifies as being of the world, because that matters, we need to know. John offers up another quiz here to help you figure that out so that you can know what to avoid. Three questions. Does that thing, whatever it is, that thought that action satisfy the lust of the flesh? Does it appeal to the lust of the eyes? Is it grounded in the pride of life? If so, then yes. It is of the world, and it's evil. It's not of God. In the Greek, lust it means a longing or a desire. So lust of the flesh is to be guided by a longing or a desire to feel physical pleasure. Its only purpose is to pacify the nature of the sin that lives in our flesh even after redemption.
We see it in Galatians 5, verse 19. It's explained. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean if you stumble into one of those, you're saved and you stumble one day into one of those, that you're not going to the kingdom. No, it's talking about if this, is, if this is what you're about, if this is what your life looks like, if this is what you're aligned with, then you're not aligned with me, Jesus would say. Side note, since sorcery is on the list, I don't know if any of you guys are into witchcraft or magic. Probably not. But I want you to know that it's a wider word than that. The Greek word for this, you might know the, the Greek word for it? Pharmakia. What do we get from pharmakia? Pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, drugs, sorcery, magic, witchcraft. Same thing as drugs. Same thing as drug abuse or use. That's right. Am I one of those pastors who uses this to denounce prescribed legitimate medicine use? No. You will never hear me say that. Though, I would prefer that we pray for healing first instead of turning to the help of that first. I, if I'm going to turn to medicine, I want it to be in the context of, God, do you want me to take medicine? Or would you rather just heal me? Because I'll give you glory either way. I will say that. I think that shows love for him. I think that shows trust for him. I think that's something he can bless. And sometimes he heals. And that's exciting. I love when that happens. But... For abuse of prescription meds, which is a big problem in our culture, big problem in our city. Use of legal or illegal substances, such as alcohol or marijuana or anything else that's, that has the purpose of altering your mindset just because you want or think you need it. Yes, I'm one of those pastors who will always be against that because it's lust of the flesh. It's seeking a, a help that's not from God. Just like pornography, any other evil thing that only exists to pacify physical pleasure. Those things are sin. They cannot bring a blessing. It's impossible. Even if they bring a moment of pleasure, they cannot bring a blessing. They are of the world, and the world is passing away. Lust of the eyes, to be consumed with a longing or a desire to obtain something that you see. This is America's sin. We love to covet things. We covet everything. And all day long, we, we get to see commercials. Man, if you just had this, if you just had this, if you just had this. And sometimes we're like, yeah, yeah, if I just had that. My favorite Dave Ramsey quote, we are a nation that spends money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like. That's where covetousness has led us. Consumed with a longing or desire to obtain something that you see. Its only purpose is to satisfy covetousness, which is of the flesh. It's prohibited by God. And we see what happens in Scripture when this becomes a problem. The, the Israelites had this amazing victory at Jericho, right? The walls come tumbling down. It's glorious. And the next little town on the list, think, think the difference between Nashville and Shelbyville. Okay, the next battle was against Shelbyville. And so David sent, or Joshua sent some spies out, and they look at it like, hey, no big deal. This, this little village is not a problem. We'll just send a few guys over there. We'll wipe them out and move on to what's next. Well, what happened? They got whooped pretty good by AI, this little town. And David's on his knees. He's crying out to God, oh, why did you send us over there to, to die? And God said, stop. Stop. There's sin in the camp, Joshua. 
I couldn't give you victory there, even though it should have been easy. Because there's sin in the camp. He had told them before Jericho, hey, this is my battle. This is my glory. I'm going to do something amazing, and you're going to see that I'm your God, and they're going to see that I'm your God. Everybody's going to hear the story and know who your God is. That's what it's about. Don't take any of the stuff. Don't take any of the gold. Don't take any of the silver. Don't take any of the art. Don't take anything. It's all mine, God said. But what happened? Coveting happened. The lust of the eyes happened. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent. Lust of the eyes. Pride of life. To be consumed with a longing or a desire to be, or at least be seen as, more substantial than others. Its only purpose is to make you feel like you're somebody higher, more important, more wealthy, more religious, more talented, more whatever, which is self centered and of the flesh. James chapter 4, verse 16 says, But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. The pride of life. So am I saying that physical pleasure or having things that you enjoy or having a position of importance or even being more substantial in some way in the eyes of someone else is inherently evil? Of course not. Paul told us back in Romans chapter 14, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. It's not wrong to have any of those things if it's in the context of, Lord, what do you want me to have today? What do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go today? What do you have for me today? He gives those things to people who follow him to whatever degree is best for us. So no, those things are not bad. Is lust inherently bad? Of course not. Lust is simply a longing or a desire. There are plenty of things that you should feel that way about. The word translated lust sometimes is translated more simply as just desire. And yeah, there can be a negative connotation to that. In John's Gospel, chapter 8, Jesus says, You are of your father the devil and the desires, the lust of your father you want to do. But there are also positive examples too. From Jesus, in Luke chapter 22, verse 15, Jesus says, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. As with everything else, it comes down to your heart concerning these things. What is the object of your desire, of your lust, and is it something you're allowed to have? And is it something God wants for you? Are you desiring things to gain the pleasure they provide, or are you desiring them, if the Lord wills, inside His perfect plan for your life? Are you wanting the relationship with Jesus that brings legitimate pleasure, joy, and accolades, or do you just want the pleasure, the joy, and the accolades? That's the difference. Is the temptation to step outside the lines in these areas natural? It is to the flesh. So if you haven't yet made Jesus the Lord of your life, then these things govern everything about your life. It's all you know. It's all you can chase after. If He is the Lord of your life already, then these things remain alive inside the flesh that your transformed spirit walks around in. Will your flesh, the devil, and the culture you live in encourage you to seek these things? Even try to convince you that it's your right to have all of them with no restrictions whatsoever? Absolutely. All day, every day. And it's been that way ever since the garden. When Eve was tempted to eat the forbidden fruit, all of those influences were in play. Satan was there encouraging her to eat it. She wanted to eat it in the flesh. And the culture... 
everybody in the world, Adam, (laughs) didn't try to stop her. And he was right there with her. Which means he was in favor of it as well. He was encouraging it. So how does one stand in righteousness amid this overwhelming negative influence? Find out what is true. Choose to believe it. Act like you believe it. Simple. Simplify. When speaking of the lust of the flesh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Regarding the lust of the eyes, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, take heed. And beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Finally, when it comes to the pride of life, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, it gives insight into the example of, uh, that Jesus provides. Because again, he is our template. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You see the proactive nature of it? This is how you fight back against the lust of the eyes and the flesh and the pride of life. You choose to go the opposite direction. You choose to humble yourself and serve your God. Why? Because he's God. Why else? Because he loves you. And what he tells you to do is what's best for you. And why? Because everything else is passing away. Always remember that these things which seem to bring so much satisfaction to you in the moment are going to disappear. Like verse 17 said, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And so there again is the word for the day, the word for this season, abide, remain, continue in. The fact that those who do the will of God by following Jesus will continue forever, never fading away or being destroyed is a point worth remembering. Some of you will have heard of Jim Elliott. He was a missionary. He was killed with four other missionaries in uh, South America in the 50s. They found his journal and, and were reading through it, and they found this quote. He is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And that describes our life. We are to lay everything else down, cling to Jesus. The things of this world will pass by you and they will pass away. But the love of God shown in his redemption of your life lasts forever. Since you can only have one of those two things be the guiding force of your life. I suggest you choose the latter. It's up to you. Grow up. Grow up in your faith. Let it mature. Let it progress. From a little child to a young adult to a parental figure in the faith. Don't allow the bright and shiny things of the world to even compete with the everlasting light of the presence of the Lord Jesus in your life. One will always let you down and the other will always lift you up. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for speaking to us today. I pray that you are glorified by how we treat your word. And I pray that you are further glorified with how we take it now and apply it to our lives. Lord, help us to see the difference between the things of the world and the things of God so that we can choose what is of you. Give us wisdom, discernment to see what things in our life maybe we need to lay down and walk away from altogether. Or maybe we at least need to stop emphasizing them so much. Choosing to emphasize our relationship with you instead. Maybe we need to realign some things which will naturally happen if we focus on our relationship with you first. Thank you for being a gracious, merciful God. It tells us what you expect, tells us why you expect it, and tells us what will happen if we don't follow. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. May you be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. Love you all.